Uh, welcome. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, my name is Larry Rosenthal. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Right Wing Studies here at uh, the University of California. Um, and today is our first colloquium of the fall semester. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, we have a couple of sponsors who have been uh, uh, it's been our pleasure to work with to, to put this event together. They include the Institute of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies and the EU Center, both here on campus. Um, if, if I can, before we begin, I would like to talk about, uh, alert you to the next event in our series this semester, which is on Thursday, November 13th. Uh, we will present a talk entitled The Great European War, which is World War I, of which this is the 100th anniversary year, um, and the rise of radical Shinto ultranationalism in Japan. It will be presented by Walter Skaya, who is Associate Professor of History and Director of Asian Studies at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Um, and he, he, he has written a chapter in the forthcoming book, um, The New Nationalism and the First World War, which will be published exactly two weeks from today, and of which I am one of the co-editors. Okay. Um, uh, please, I would ask everybody to turn off cell phones if you haven't done so already. Also. Oh, it's going around. There's a sign-up sheet. Um, it, it does good for us if you sign up, uh, sign the sign-up sheet. So we would appreciate that. Um, here's how this event will work. Professor Wittenberg will speak for around 45 minutes, at which point we will open things up for questions and comments from the audience. Um, Okay, I think that's all the announcements I need, um, and therefore I can move to the pleasure of introducing Professor Jason Wittenberg. Um, professor Wittenberg is an associate professor of political science here at the University of California. Um, he received his PhD in political science from MIT, and his teaching and research uh, interests include ethnic conflict, Eastern European politics, and empirical research methods. He is the author and co-author of numerous scholarly articles and book chapters. Um, his current book manuscript uh, explains patterns of popular anti-Jewish violence in wartime Eastern Europe, and today's talk is entitled Hungary's Conservative Revolution Sui Generis or Future Pattern. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Wittenberg. Thanks, um, Larry. Thanks uh, to the Center for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, this is a part of a project um, on Hungarian democracy. It's sort of a, a, a project that I worked on a long time ago and then, I, and then I stopped working on it and then events in Hungary have, uh, over the past few years, have sort of pulled me back. And so this new project uh, uh, kind of has two components. One of them is uh, uh, examining what's going on, uh, what has been going on for the past four years in Hungary from a historical perspective. So kind of, uh, you know, how can we think about it in terms of historical legacies, a bit of which I'll say, uh, a talk about now. But the, but the other part of the project is, is about, uh, you know, what, what is going on and especially how do we interpret what's going on and what does this tell us about the, uh, you know, limitations of democracy and it's mostly the latter uh, that I'm going to uh, talk about today, although of course I'm happy to talk about the others as well. Um, before I begin, I, uh, in putting together this uh, presentation, I had the help of uh, research assistant uh, Laura Yachty. Uh, so thanks to her for uh, assisting me with locating some numbers um, to show you. Mm -hmm. 
So just a brief outline of what we're going to do. Uh, I'm probably going to spend uh, uh, the plurality of the time talking about the changes uh, that have been made. I actually, uh, I'm looking at this title, uh, Hungary's Conservative Revolution, and I'm realizing that it's only really conservative in one way. Uh, in some other ways, it's actually quite radical. Uh, you know, it depends on what your baseline is for, uh, you know, uh, conservative with respect to what or radical with respect to what. Fidesz has been making changes um, since it uh, came to power in 2010 that are at least as fundamental and arguably in some ways more fundamental than the changes that occurred after the transition from uh, state socialism to uh, democracy in 1989 and 1990. So, so in this sense, it's radical. Uh, in a different sense, it's conservative in the sense that it really uh, is uh, in some ways backward looking, forward looking in one way, but using uh, older historical, um, uh, you know, older parts of history as a, as, a, as a kind of an example for the way to move forward. So it's, so it's conservative in that sense. So, so first of all, we're going to talk about uh, the changes that are being made. The, the, the second thing is, what do the changes mean? And here, um, here is where the talk really intersects with uh, things that have been uh, you know, going on in op-ed pages and articles. So if you've followed this at all uh, in the last few years, uh, you'll find articles all over the place. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, the, the Washington Post, the New York Times, all, you know, also in Europe, Der Spiegel, uh, all over the place, describing what's going on and interpreting what's going on. Uh, and uh, I'll just say, just by way of, uh, in some ways, anticipating some of the things I, I will say later, which is that in general, the, the changes have been portrayed as uh, anti-democratic. So particularly on the op-ed side of things, uh, people like uh, George Konrad and other uh, you know, important political figures in Hungary have basically accused the Orban government of uh, creating a junk democracy or a sham democracy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is how it's typically uh, interpreted. And I want to step back a little bit from that. Uh, it's not that it's completely, uh, there is something to that, but I think those arguments are a bit overdrawn. And uh, among these, uh, 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 you know, many people, not all, but many people, uh, are not making proper distinctions between an illiberal change and an anti-democratic change. And so we'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, during the talk. And then finally, of course, the question that we're, uh, you know, the, the question that we're faced with, which is, is Hungary the future of Eastern? Well, I have Eastern in parentheses, uh, you know, is Hungary the future of Europe? So, so is this the ghost of, is Hungary the ghost of Christmas future? Uh, my answer to that, you know, I hope you don't leave the room, you know, my answer to that is probably, pr probably not. Uh, probably not, for a, for a number of reasons that we'll talk about. So, first of all, um, the vote. So, what happened? Um, you know, basically, so, so Hungary democratized. Uh, Hungary had its first post-communist national parliamentary election in 1990. So since then, uh, we've had a one, two, three, four, uh, you know, before 2010, four cycles. And what you had basically in the first, um, in, in all the cycles up to 2010, you had more or less a, an exchange of power between the left and the right. So right after communism, unsurprisingly, the left got kicked out and a center-right coalition came in for the first four years. And then after that, the socialists came in. And then after that, Fidesz actually came in for a cycle uh, with a, a much fewer votes than it has now. And the socialists came in for two. So it was like an, and, and they were pretty evenly matched as it turns out. If you look at, uh, you know, a sort of, you know, 40 plus for one side and 40 plus to another. So it was a kind of a uh, what, what evolved eventually into a bipolar system, a left-right system. Uh, Hungary's a parliamentary uh, democracy, and so it's a multi-party system. It's not a presidential system uh, as in you know, the U.S. or even in Poland. So it's you know, multiple parties. Then in 2010, for reasons that I will go into later, 
uh, you had a kind of a political cataclysm, and I, I don't want to elaborate on that now. We'll talk about that later. You had a cataclysm in which all of a sudden uh, voters switched to the right. And so let me just, uh, for those in the back, uh, the blue uh, is 2014. The blue bars are 2014, and the red are 2010. So, so Hungary just had a parliamentary election uh, this, uh, uh, earlier this year. And you can see, in, if you look at 2010 in red, Fides, which is, a, a, which is the party mostly we're going to be talking about today, the Alliance of Young Democrats, which is this uh, you know, conservative, uh, you know, hard to classify it actually, but we'll ca call it a conservative party, uh, got over 50% um, of the votes uh, uh, of the popular vote and uh, together with the uh, Christian Democrats, which is a very small party, you know, maybe one or two seats that they got, so it's mostly Fidesz and over two-thirds of the parliamentary seats. Right? So that's the, that's the red and you can see in blue uh, with the uh, election, so the popular vote went down and, but they just made it over the two-thirds. Uh, this two-thirds of the parliament is going to turn out to be important because this is the trigger that has uh, allowed Fidesz to do uh, what it's been doing. And, and just to uh, spend one minute on the rest of this, here is uh, the, the MSP is the, are the socialists, which are the largest opposition, and uh, Unity is a, is a coalition of parties. And so you see that the next biggest opposition, which is on the left, is actually quite small um, uh, in terms of votes and even smaller in terms of seats. Um, another thing, so I, I might well have given an entire talk about these third set of bars, which is Jobbik, the movement for a better Hungary, which is an extreme right. Uh, it really is kind of a fascist uh, throwback uh, party. Uh, my, my last slide in this presentation, uh, I have a few things to say about Jobbik if we have time. Um, so that's Jobbik and, you know, just one other smaller party. So uh, one comment on this is that if you look at the combination of Jobbik and Fidesz, so they're both... Uh, they're both right-wing parties of different, uh, of different types. They have a huge proportion of the popular vote, 70%, over 70%, and also, you know, over 70% of the seats in Parliament since 2010. So this is just a massive swing to the right, either in Fidesz uh, colors or, uh, you know, or uh, Ala Jobbik, which, which I think can be explained. Um, but, 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 it, but it was a kind of massive political event. So where do we start? So Fidesz got a supermajority in parliament. A supermajority in parliament. And as it turns out, with a supermajority in parliament, you can... Um, uh, the rules for amending the constitution is... Uh, well, it, uh, it's a bit uh, complicated, but uh, the supermajority in Parliament allowed Fidesz to uh, essentially junk the own old constitution and uh, you know, create a new constitution unilaterally, right? because it had this supermajority. And basically, it could do anything it want, and, and this, this is important to, uh, for us later, without the consultation of the opposition. So theoretically, they could just do it, even if the opposition left, because they had the requisite number of votes in Parliament, you know, fair and square. This, by the way, is a stamp that was issued in, they call it a basic law. This, uh, uh, they're not, uh, that's the term for it. And this was a stamp issued um, uh, in, you know, commemoration in 2011. And this says, you know, God bless the Hungarians and, you know, if you were wondering whether it had a kind of traditionalist leaning, you, uh, you know, this may give it away. This is the Holy Crown, um, uh, which is a symbol of the continuity of Hungarian statehood and, uh, you know, kings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, um, so the first thing they had to do uh, was take care of the Constitution. And, and one, uh, uh, beyond the obvious reason... Uh, to attack first the Constitution was that uh, before 2010, the Hungarian Constitutional Court was actually quite activist uh, in terms of uh, interpreting laws uh, in, in uh, uh, whether or not they were in accord with the Constitution then in force. Right? 
And so, and, and, the, and the people on the Constitutional Court, which I'll mention more about in a moment, of course, not uh, typically Fides, uh, uh, you know, Fides sympathizers. So, so it was filled with uh, liberals, uh, you know, basically liberal and socialist leaning uh, judges. And so Fides knew that this had to be the target if it wanted to get something done. So um, Fides actually saw the old constitution. Uh, 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 well, so, so, so for Fides, the old constitution was nothing but a modified version of the Stalin constitution that was done in 1949. And for Fides, even though it had been amended many, many times and all the, uh, well, the Stalin stuff wasn't so bad, actually, except that no one paid any attention to it. Uh, you know, freedom of religion, you know, it was great, uh, uh, but they didn't do anything with it. Uh, Anyway, they amended all of that, but for Fides, this was still like an alien, you know, this was an alien imposed constitution and uh, it needed to be gotten rid of. Most of the most important changes that we're going to be talking about today are actually put into the constitution through this procedure uh, called passing cardinal laws, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, I say the, the, uh, the supermajority gave Fides a free hand. It, it does give Fides a free hand, but there were there there is opposition. So they don't have to they don't have to consult the parliamentary opposition, but there's popular opposition. Uh, so there have been a lot of uh, public demonstrations against various things, and also uh, there's been opposition from the EU, especially, but also the US and some other uh, organizations. And this has actually resulted in some minor. Uh, you know, changes to certain laws, uh, which we'll, we'll deal with in a moment. So first, the Constitution. The Constitutional Court, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about uh, what's in the Constitution as we go along. So some of these things are being put into the Constitution. The Constitutional Court. So you can write a constitution, but it doesn't do any good if the old justices are there and are going to uh, interpret things however they interpret things. So, so, so one of the first things they did, uh, or one of the things they did was change the process for nominating judges. Before 2010, you had to have a two-thirds of the parliamentary vote plus a majority of parliamentary parties. So you couldn't do it without some opposition going along with it. Well, Fidesz got rid of the second part about having the majority of uh, parliamentary parties, so now it's just a two-thirds vote, which was great because they had the two-thirds. Um, so, so that was gone. Um, they also, uh, relatedly, this is related to point three on court packing, they lowered the retirement age uh, of judges from 70 to 62. So this, this gets rid of the older and, of course, uh, more antipathetic judges from Fidesz's perspective removed many oppon opponents. This, uh, uh, this uh, decision was actually recently overturned, like three months ago maybe. Uh, bo bo uh, this was overturned uh, because it was unfair to the retired judges, retiring judges who were not given enough notice. Uh, the point is that uh, it was too late for those. Uh, so so there'll, be compensa there'll be some form of compensation for the judges, but, 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 but it doesn't change the, uh, you know, the result of the decision. It also, Fides also increased the number of judges, I believe from five to, is it 12 or 14, I forget how many, uh, probably an odd number, uh, hopefully an odd number. Um, it increased the number of judges and of course uh, engineered things so that, so that it could put its own people. So it, it controls the uh, commission, if you will, that, uh, that is in, responsible for the nomination process and so it basically was able to f fill the constitutional court with its own allies. And of course, restriction of jurisdiction would be uh, the other thing. And so, so activist court before 2010, after, uh, for example, uh, there, was, there would be no more review of laws about budget and taxes unless those, those laws infringed other rights, such as religion and conscience. And so, so essentially, this g gave Fidesz a freer hand in economic po policy. And it's used this. For example, it nationalized all the private pensions. Uh, pensions that had been privatized were then renationalized, right? and these were all written into the Constitution. So, so that's the, the first weakening of the checks and balances is the Constitution, or arguably the most important. 
The second, or a second aspect of it is the media. So they create a, so, so media conflicts had been going on since uh, the end of communism about you know, who is going to control uh, the media because obviously people get their news in, and at least they think it sways public opinion. So they create a national media council that is again dominated by Fides appointees. They're doing, by the way, all of this legally, right? So, so from a procedural perspective, there's nothing illegal about what Fides is doing. Absolutely nothing. So they create a media council, then they fill it with Fides appointees, and this council's powerful. Uh, it, it deals with regulation, approving radio frequencies. It's like the, you know, the FCC, uh, but it also allocates money to you know, public broadcasters. So it allocates money to the public media. So it has control of the purse strings, which of course gives it an incredible amount of power. Uh, the, the most controversial thing vis-a-vis -vis the media actually wasn't that. It was a, a decision uh, uh, to impose fines for putting out a quote-unquote objectionable content, right? Imbalanced com content that incites hatred, violates public morality, et cetera, et cetera. This was seen, of course, well, who, who decides, uh, you know, what violates public morality? You know, ever the question, who decides what's objectionable? And of course, Fetus will decide through its appointees on the National Media Council. And this, uh, this, is actually from the European par this is actually from the European Parliament, a protest against this law in which Green Party members are holding up uh, kind of the front pages of uh, media, uh, you know, uh, print media, newspapers and magazines, saying censored uh, as a protest against this, uh, this silencing of dissent. This was actually, this is a case in which the law was actually slightly, uh, made slightly more liberal due to profound opposition at the EU level and other levels. For example, it no longer, uh, it no longer applies, applies to print media or online media, but I think it still applies to television uh, uh, and so forth. And cleverly, by the way, Fides in part justifies this uh, with reference to Jobbik. So, so Jobbik, uh, which we'll talk about, it really is a kind of a nasty, uh, uh, you know, you could call it a fascist party for reasons that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about later. And, uh, you know, some in Fidesz say, look, we need this in order to keep Jobbik from, from inciting hatred, uh, you know, against, uh, uh, you know, against minorities and against foreigners and against uh, other people that they deem enemies. So, you know, it's a little complicated in that sense. And then finally, of course, there have been, you know, there has been pressure on opposition voices. This is not just uh, th these are not just a kind of paranoid fantasies on the part of the opposition. So, for example, there was an attempt to silence a private radio station, Club Radio, by not approving its license. So, so not censoring it uh, as such, but, you know, we're not going to give you a new license. Uh, didn't work, uh, again, through opposition. Another journalist at a government-owned uh, radio station, Koshut, uh, radio was suspended for protesting the change in the treatment of the media. So, so he actually had a moment of silence. He was protested for a moment of, you know, for, for having silence on the radio as a protest against, uh, you know, using this National Media Council as a means of uh, squelching, uh, you know, opposition voices. And of all the, uh, of all the things Fidesz has done, this, along with the with the abuse of cardinal laws are arguably the most under, undemocratic things uh, that, that they're doing. Because if you silence the opposition, then, then you've crossed the line uh, uh, over into something else. More about that later. So the media, uh, and then these cardinal laws. These cardinal laws. So what are cardinal laws? So cardinal laws are laws uh, you know, like the Constitution that require a two-thirds majority to overturn. So Fidesz has the two-thirds supermajority, so it's able to pass, the, pass these cardinal laws. But then to overturn them, it would re require another two-thirds majority. Now Fidesz knows well that its two-thirds uh, majority um, uh, was very unusual. Uh, very unusual for one party to win that much in a multi-party system for reasons that we'll talk about in a couple of slides. They were able to do this. So, 
So by passing these cardinal laws, Fides is essentially institutionalizing, um, you know, institutionalizing its own authority even after the time when in the future uh, it could be voted out of office if it doesn't, you know, get a majority, uh, just a simple majority uh, of the votes. And it's doing this um, uh, one way, which I haven't mentioned yet, but r relates to an earlier slide, which is it's doing this by these media, these councils that it's creating that are being filled with Fides appointees. They have very long tenures, the people in these, like the media council and the judicial uh, council. I think their tenures are nine, their tenure is nine years. So if Fides gets voted out uh, in four years, it essentially has locked in, uh, you know, its own people uh, through the next two cycles, right? So it's, it's institutionalizing its authority in this way. And also, by passing these laws, um, uh, uh, those were passed with similar laws that, that will be very difficult for future parliaments. Even, even a majority of the, when a majority of the people want to change it, they won't be able to do it because they need a super majority. Now, the way these kinds of laws are usually used, uh, and now this is in the kind of like the legal, uh, the, the legal view of things, is that they're usually restricted to fundamental issues of process you know, rules for elections, separation of powers. Uh, uh, it's kind of, they're, they're more concerned, usually more concerned with process than with content. So the criticism of Fides, uh, well, a criticism of Fides is that it's using them for its own partisan. So it's locking in its own partisan view. It's not a changing the process, it's changing the content. I'll more about that in a moment. They're using it to uh, uh, partisan advantage uh, uh, in order to entrench trench themselves in the future so, uh, and to implement their own social policy. So on social policy, protection of families, right? If you look at the Constitution, uh, it's, it declares the family is the basic unit of society uh, based on marriage between an, a man and a woman and with life beginning at conception. Now, you know, these are perfectly valid, uh, you know, these are perfectly valid things to, to have, but Normally, uh, those kinds of uh, changes would not be integrated into the, essentially the DNA of the country through the Constitution uh, uh, in, in this particular unilateral way. So, so procedurally, procedurally, they can do it. It's just that it, it hits up against a norm rather than a rule. Uh, and the norm would be that you're not supposed to use these, you're supposed to use these things more for procedural things rather than... Uh, rather than to tip the scale in a partisan way, one or the other. The stat, I'll just list a couple of the status of churches. So for reasons that will be uh, clear to all of you uh, here, you know, if you know anything about communism, is that the post-communist state decided to be very liberal in regard to the recognition of religion. Of course, this is against the background of, of heavy religious repression under the communists. And so after they say, you know, we're going to take an American view, which is that if you can get 100 people together and call yourself a religion, we're not going to be too strict about whether we think, you know, if you want to be a Wiccan, you know, that's fine. Register as a, are there any Wiccans in here? <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I'll know, I'm getting hate mail from uh, the Berkeley Wiccan Society. Uh, so, so nothing wrong with being a Wiccan, by the way. So, so uh, you know, if you want to do that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the view of the early post-communist period was we're going to let you do that and we're going to let you register uh, as a religion. So what Fides, uh, what Fides did is it said, okay, you know, uh, it's, a, it's sort of run amok. So, so you have a lot of different religious groupings. And it decides to revert to an earlier model, which, by the way, is the German model, the current German model, which recognizes historic churches, right, Churches that were recognized under older pre-communist you know, pre laws. And then, so to create two categories. One is for these historic churches that automatically get recognition. So these are the usual suspects. Uh, uh, you know, all of the bigger churches that you, know, you would think of that had any historical presence in Hungary get, uh, get recognized under this. And then everybody else including, you know, Mormons and, uh, you know, new, new, new religions that came after communism have to re-register. Now there are, now the, 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 the trick is that the historical churches get tax advantages, right, because in some sense they run some schools and they just get tax money because they're historically part of the country. 
So you have to get registered as a religion in order to have the tax advantages. But the new rules for registering a, a religion are more strict. And if you ask me exactly how much more, I can't tell you because I, I, I didn't look at that degree of granularity. But they're sort of uh, you know looking a little more closely to make sure you're not a sham religion uh, and you're just in it for the tax. Um, you're in it for the tax money. And so, again, this provoked a lot of uh, outcries for perfectly valid churches like the Mormons that, that, you know, that were not historical and therefore had to, had to uh, go about this. So that's a second thing. And then the third thing, very important, parliamentary elections. Fides shrunk the size of parliament from 386, which was way too big for a country the size of Hungary, by the way, uh, <laughs> So some things Fides says you can agree with without a, a, agreeing with, uh, you know, Fides. Uh, uh, so, so it was actually a good thing that they shrunk it. Uh, 386 to 199, right? The, the issue here for, for, criti for critics uh, is that the, their districts were heavily gerrymandered. Again, there's nothing, this is part of the democratic, uh, you know, this is part of democratic system is, they, is there's gerrymandering. I mean, we invented it. The U.S. invented it gerrymandered uh, districts, and obviously gerrymandered in their own favor, right? So, you know, no party gerrymanders di districts in the opposition party's favor, and so, <laughs> so you know, they created districts that, um, uh, you know, were better for it. Um, that, that's one thing they did. A uh, second thing they did is there were some restrictions on political advertising in, the pri in private media. Again, this was kind of targeting the opposition. Not a ban on it, but restrictions. And uh, per, in, in some ways, theoretically the most interesting, they uh, allowed uh, Hungarians in the Habsburg successor states to, uh, to vote, to register to vote. And this is, this is extremely, this is one of the most illiberal things that they've done because a, a bedrock of uh, liberal, uh, the, the way we organize things now is that you're a citizen of a country, that's the country, the country you have the passport for is the country you vote in. It's not the country to whose nation you belong. And so this was like, uh, you know, instead of citizenship, it's, it's like a recognition based on nationality. We can talk about that more. Um, it's also related to an earlier status law regarding um, Hungarians uh, in the neighboring countries. So, so these were opposed uh, uh, by people. And again, uh, one of many demonstrations and this sign says uh, the Constitution is not a game. So Fides was accused of, because it can do anything it wants, of just you know, throwing things into the Constitution uh, you know, willy-nilly because it can do it. So what about the content? So mostly I've talked about process, although we've, we've uh, hinted a little bit about, uh, you know, we've hinted a little bit about content, uh, but mostly it's been about process. Fides is not liberal. Uh, it, this was clear from the things it was doing before. And uh, for those of you that have seen or heard uh, or read of uh, uh, Prime Minister Orban's uh, speech in Tushnad, which is a kind of a meeting that takes place in, uh, in uh, Romania every year, in a Hungarian region of Romania, uh, Orban listed, you know, Orban, you know, just came out, came out as an illiberal. Uh, it was sort of, it was obvious to anyone who, looked at it, but if you were in any doubt, you could be in no doubt after this speech. He listed the problems of liberalism, and I'll just list them now uh, from his perspective. Uh, Non-recognition of a Hungarian national interest. Non-recognition of a Hungarian national interest. So this is a criticism of the individuality as opposed to the communal, uh, the individual notion of liberalism that he's referring to as opposed to the communal. Non-protection of public wealth. Right? A lot of Hungary's uh, you know, public assets were either sold to foreigners uh, in the first you know, 8 to 12 years uh, you know, after 1989, including you know, uh, uh, you know, companies that might ha had you invested more in them, you know, might have become international players, but they were sold off. And secondly, uh, what wasn't sold off from Orban's perspective, a lot of it was sold off or looted by former communists. Right. So Fides and Orban in particular uh, accuse, and there is something to this, uh, accuse the inheritors of the old ruling party of basically using their position to loot public assets. And in, in part, it's, uh, it's absolutely true. Uh, and not just in Hungary, but throughout the region. 
Non-protection from indebtedness. Again, a criticism of, uh, a criticism of liberalism. Non-protection from, uh, you know, one of the negative aspects uh, of, uh, of the freedom that came in 1990 was, uh, you know, sex, violence, and all these other social ills were, you know, people were free to do what they wanted. So it just all emerged into the, what had been hidden, uh, 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 you know, then was uh, all out for the public to see. And so, so have, you know, blaming liberalism for this. And he was open in his effort to build a non-liberal state. And in fact, uh, the thing that got the most uh, uh, new, uh, worldwide news is that he openly lauded, lauded, L-A-U-D-E-D, Singapore, China, India, Turkey, and Russia as the stars of uh, you know, international analyses. Those, those are his, word, his words. <laughs> so these are the countries that are definitely illiberal, but people talk about them as if they're uh, uh, you know, accomplishing things. Um, uh, you know, people talk about them in a positive way, even though they're not particularly liberal in the way that they view things. And this is, you know, this is his view uh, of the way of the way forward. So that's point one. Uh, the second point is a lustration um, of successors to the old ruling party. So one way to think about what Fidesz is doing now is, in terms of a term we used in the 1990s, uh, lustration, which means cleansing, which is that after uh, democracy came. There was this fear, you know, people didn't want all the old communists and all the positions of authority, right? So <laughs> democracy comes, but you still got a huge bureaucracy, you know, the commanding heights of the economy uh, that are all full of former regime people. I mean, who else would there be uh, in there? And so there were great efforts to kind of purge, uh, you know, get them to retire and to purge them. And I actually view what Fetus is doing as a kind of a radical version of this. It was never... Uh, 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 it was never, uh, you know, fully done before, for a number of reasons. And Orban uh, and Fidesz, uh, more generally, is really using this opportunity to, you know, excise, uh, you know, the socialists, uh, you know, essentially from the body politic to the extent that he can do it. Actually, holds successes. If you look at the preamble. The preamble uh, and uh, other parts of the Article U of the Constitution uh, is very interesting because it holds the successors of the old ruling party, not the old ruling party, but the successors of it. It, he, it says they share responsibility for the, along with their predecessors for the crime of the old regime, for the crimes of the old regime. This is Article U. So it isn't just the old communists that are blamed. But the biggest opposition party, which is the socialists, which is the legal inheritor of the old ruling party, it holds them. It's one half of a step short of criminalizing the largest opposition party. Uh, uh, and in fact, they're setting up a national memory, uh, I forget what they call it, in order to investigate communist crimes. So that's the second point on um, the illiberal. And the third. Uh, is, a, uh, is the positives or, or the, you know, what they actually um, uh, believe, you know, which is, so, so, you know, I struggled actually for a word, so a conservative natural, national approach to politics. What does this mean? Well, the preamble to the Constitution says, and I quote, we hold that after the decades of the 20th century, which led to a state of moral decay, we have an abiding need for spiritual and intellectual renewal, end quote. Now, this, uh, in, a, in a different paper, uh, I refer to this as a whiff of the 1930s. Uh, uh, this, uh, you know, the spiritual and intellectual renewal was very much a 1930s and a 1940s way of referring to sort of the decadence, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the decadence of the, you know, the 1920s and 1930s as opposed to, uh, you know, something else. Fidesz wants, and I say Orban, I'm saying Orban or I say Fidesz, Orban is a very powerful figure. I mean, some people say Orban is Fidesz. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but, but, but Orban really rules um, this party. Fidesz wants policy freedom to improve the nation without liberal interference from either the EU or the, U or the US. So they don't want foreigners to interfere, and it has said multiple times, mind your own business, this is domestic matter. What this means in practice is something that has been going on actually in Russia and other places, which is pressure on civil society organizations funded by foreign governments. So there's been pressure. 
uh, you know, uh, you know, not an outright uh, police sweep, but it's sort of, uh, you know, administrative pressure, financial pressure, other pressures uh, on these things because they're seen as foreign influence. Strong support for um, uh, ethnic Hungarians, you know, Hungarians living in the Habsburg successor states. We've talked about this before with voting rights. By the way, the the Hungarians uh, beyond the board, the Hungarians of Slovakia and Romania that did vote uh, in the elect in this last election voted 95 percent for Fidesz. There's muted support for rehabilitating the interwar uh, regent Miklos Horthy. This is a push that this is what Jobbik is really pushing for. So Jobbik is the main driver behind the rehabilitation of Horthy. Who's actually, by the way, uh, you'll have to ask me, because he's a more complicated figure than is usually portrayed. Uh, I don't have time to go into it now. Uh, he, he's complicated, um, but he was definitely a dictator. And uh, Jobbik is pushing this, so the extreme right is pushing this. And Fidesz is, is, is sort of condemning this because it needs to, but uh, half-heartedly. What do the changes mean? Okay. So they're procedurally democratic. They are procedurally democratic, where they violate things, um, they're violating norms. They're not violating, uh, you know, strictly speaking, democratic rules. That, that's my view. What norms are they violating? So there are some norms. This forces us to think, you know, what norms of democracy do we take for granted that we don't usually specify, uh, but that we think are important. Well, one of them, uh, and maybe the most important one, is uh, for consensus, as opposed to unilateral actions. So they're not consulting the opposition. They're, they mathematically don't have to consult the opposition, but there's a democratic norm that particularly for changes of this magnitude, you're supposed to consult uh, uh, the opposition. And by not consulting the opposition, you're actually lowering the, quali uh, the quality of democracy uh, because there will be less, uh, the democratic system will be less legitimate if, it, if these changes are seen as not uh, emerging consensually, but instead imposed by one half of the partisan political system on the other half of the uh, partisan political system. Secondly, uh, regarding, the, regarding actually the changes they've been making, um, it's simply not true that democracies require a separation of power. So if you look at what democracy is, there, there's nothing in there that says you have to have a separation of powers or a system of checks and balances. It says it doesn't, uh, it, you can even have a democracy with restricted political speech and with, uh, and, and uh, democracy does not require nonpartisan political boundaries. It just doesn't. And this is one of the things that I actually agree with uh, Fides with, is that the EU and the US are trying to impose liberal democracy. Uh, and uh, this is just not liberal democracy. This is, it, it might not be fully democratic, but it's definitely illiberal. It's illiberal. So some of the criticisms, for example, of uh, removing the checks on the constitutional court, they do lead to a worse democracy for the reasons that I said. But they're not strictly speaking, strictly speaking, anti-democratic. They just give you a poorer democracy. They just give you a poorer democracy. So that's one thing. The second point is that we need to recognize that democracy can produce illiberal outcomes. Democracy can produce illiberal outcomes. You might excuse Hungarian voters in 2010 for not knowing what they would get when they elected Fidesz. You know, all party, no party, uh, go back to, uh, you know, go back to 1940, the campaign of November, uh, uh, for the election of 1945, in which the communists were uh, competing against the smallholders party. And if you go back and look at the public things, I mean, you know, the communists weren't talking about, uh, you know, gulags and uh, collectivization of agriculture and, uh, you know, a hundred other horrible things uh, that would occur. I mean, they were all about democracy. And so, you know, in some sense, uh, uh, you know, when you first elect them, you, you know, you may not know what you get. But that doesn't explain 2014. 
So, so what's interesting is that, so they did that in 2010, uh, 2010. You have these four years. 2014 runs around. They had a chance to do it. And if you recall from the first uh, thing, they, they still gave a plurality of the vote. 44% of the popular vote went to Fidesz despite all of these changes. Hungary is not a liberal country in this particular sense. Uh, and by the way, it shares that feature with other countries uh, of, of the region. Not liberal in, this, uh, in the particular sense that we've uh, been talking about. And this doesn't even include, by the way, the extreme right Yobik party, which improved its vote from 2010 to 2014. So the truth is that 65% of Hungarian voters gave, in 2014, their vote to either a pretty right-wing party or a very right-wing party. The landslide. How much time do I have left? Okay, five minutes. That's perfect. Very quickly on the landslide. Uh, you know, this means step down. Now, this, the, these are socialists, and this is Fidesz telling the socialists to step down, do, do, do what you have to do. Quickly, um, why the 2010? First of all, the center right was kind of in common. So the more moderate right, for a number of reasons, the, the right that ruled uh, in the first cycle between uh, you know, uh, uh, two, uh, 1990 to 1994, they were very inexperienced. They made a lot of mistakes. And so, so they just sort of disappeared from view. Fidesz came in and swooped in and took up this space that had been occupied by other uh, par parties on the right. So, so that was the first thing, is that the other parties made space for Fidesz. The second, I don't know why I have three, there's no two. Uh, um, three is the arrogance of the socialists. So, you know, the socialists, had, uh, in 2010, they had been in power for, for eight years. Uh, they were very self-confident. Uh, uh, they were seen as corrupt. Uh, there was a scandal involving a secret recording of... Uh, of the prime minister telling how they had lied. You know, they had to lie through their teeth uh, in order to get elected, and they'd been lying about everything in order to, uh, again, I'm simplifying, uh, and this came out, and this just provoked, a, you know, mass backlash organized by Fidesz. Uh, and so this really um, uh, uh, led to the collapse of the socialists uh, as a kind of the main second, uh, you know, as a, as a numerical competitor with Fidesz. And then finally, the lack of a viable alternative. So, so for voters in 2010, the liberals were gone, and the socialists, uh, you couldn't vote for the socialists after all of this. This left Fidesz or Jobbik. So actually, uh, the 2010 election, you know, uh, Fidesz was the left-wing party uh, in 2010 because the alternative was this fascist uh, party, which um, no one was going to do. Is Hungary the future of Eastern Europe? Um, the Fidesz victory was a fluke for the reasons that I just, uh, 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 you know, it required the collapse of the main competitors, the incompetence of the direct, uh, you know, the ideological similar uh, uh, parties uh, to Fidesz. And so in a way it was extremely unusual for this to happen in a multi-party system. It would not, it, very rare for one party to get that much of the vote in a multi-party system and unlikely to occur again anytime soon. Secondly, um, this constitutional flaw, uh, there was a flaw, uh, understandable, uh, after 1989, uh, people thought that the problem was that uh, society, that there was going to be a bunch of small parties and that all the governments would be coalitions of small parties and they wouldn't be able to get anything done. So they decided to put in a system where there was a, uh, that where the translation from votes people's votes to seats in parliament was not proportional. So, so Fidesz got 44% of the votes, but 66% of the seats. And that was in order to favor larger parties so that they could get things done. The problem is they didn't imagine that any one party would get this much, that they could unilaterally change the constitution. They thought that a coalition, but once you have a coalition of parties, then, then there's tension between the coalition about whether to make changes in the constitution. And so... So again, it was you know a sort of uh, unforeseen uh, uh, you know an unforeseen area. It's like the Weimar Constitution having these emergency decrees, which then Hitler used 
in order to, I mean, it's the same kind of, same kind of error. It's like, you know, if I were the other countries, I would remove this error immediately. This is unlikely to occur in other countries, right? This perfect storm of being able to change the constitution in precisely this way, the collapse of the parties, the victory of one party with these kinds of, uh, you know, with, with these kinds of intentions. And again, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the proportion and the, uh, you look at the coalitions uh, that are governing other, you know, right-wing uh, coalitions, they don't come anywhere near the scale of the Fidesz victory. So none of the other countries, at least at this point, is anywhere close to having you know, one party with this kind of mission being put into this kind of a, a position. And so uh, I think for now, absent a political cataclysm, uh, you know, Hungary is going to be the sole, uh, uh, the, the spearhead of this new kind of politics. Do I have more time or no? I can stop. Um, I have a Fidesz slide, but we can talk about it in the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. to open the session up for questions. Um, so, go ahead. Uh, Gökhan Özer, I'm a visiting scholar of Institute of European Studies, yep. UC Berkeley, I'm coming from Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your eye-opening and very interesting presentation. Uh, actually, the, the case of Hungary is an interesting example for me, uh, as, as a scholar and as a person from Turkey, because I think simultaneously we, we are watching a kind of remake of the same movie in Turkey for in the last decades. So if I look at from this part perspective, I have just one uh, maybe a kind of opposition to your idea, uh, giving a kind of flu and uh, the example of Hungary or the Victor Orban in Hungary, uh, because. Turkey has a tradition of parliamentary democracy till the 1920s, and if we experience similar uh, situations in Turkey nowadays in, in terms of illiberal democracy, uh, it can be a quite, uh, how I can say, possible for the Eastern European countries also, in my point of view, but this is, this is not my question. Also, uh, I'm sure you, you, you follow that uh, Victor Orban has uh, two unique examples in terms of illiberal democracies. He, he has uh, constructing ties of brotherhood. One is uh, Erdogan from Turkey, and another one is the Putin in Russia. But my question is different, actually. Uh, you know, European, I, I'd like to ask you something about the European integration of Hungary. Uh, European integration, uh, as we study it, always described itself as a kind of liberal democracy project, and it's, it's the liberal democracy is in the package of the values of the European Union. If you look at the example of Turkey, yes, we are in the process of association, and we are still a candidate country. We have, uh, I mean, different legitimizations for the uh, rise of conservative parties in Turkey, which can uh, be a kind of harmful for the human rights such as uh, the religion is different and Europe sometimes in some countries in European integration process describing them themselves with the religious religious things, uh, relig relig religious ideas. So what's but your question? If, yeah. if you look at uh, Hungary, what do you think about uh, uh, this disregard of European integration for supporting such a conservative party which can uh, rise doubts about human rights and uh, other values of the European integration process. What is your idea? Okay, so, uh, yeah, um, you know, the EU, uh, I mean, it is contrary, so, so what's going on in, in, in Hungary is contrary to some EU values on, you know, respect for minorities and, uh, and so what, you know, what Fidesz is trying to do uh, is it's, is it's uh, they're all lawyers, by the way. It's not accidental that it's been engineered in this way. That the whole, they're all lawyers and they know exactly what they're doing. They're going right to the edge. They're pushing things as far as they can, uh, as far as they possibly can. Uh, for example, with workfare projects for you know, which is seen to target a, uh, the Roma population, uh, you know, to make them work for their welfare benefits. And so, they're not. Uh, this is something I was going to say. They're not willing to sort of go it alone but they're willing to push things up to the very edge and force uh, and, until there's enough pushback that they need to, uh, 
that they need to, you know, rule things back. I'll let you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the constitutional flaw argument. Yeah. So, so is the main constitutional flaw that you're arguing about is it, or, or you know, is the is the is the key part is is it the electoral law or is it the provisions in the constitution? It's court? the provisions. Well, of the no, 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 yeah. Let me let me follow because what I'm wondering is whether it's really unusual or not. It's uh, not that I'm unusual. Not sure. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. I'm not sure that that's. It's not. In fact, if you look at. Uh, uh, you know, in the Czech Republic, it's three fifths of the deputies and three fifths of the senators. In, in Slovakia, it's three fifths of the parliament. Uh, so, le electoral law is not all that. Right? So, what's the so right. So, so it's only a flaw, sort of, in this sense, in retrospect, because they didn't imagine that. So, so the other countries. So, so it's not unusual in the region, but the other conditions don't hold in the region. So, but the point would be that if anyone ever got a substantial majority in parliament, any party. They would be in a position to in other countries. Reasons. In other countries too, it's just very unlikely for one party to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to actually yeah. follow up just a bit. Um, you know, I was very struck by the what happened in, in voting in, tw in 2010 that you, that you described. It's what we call here like a, a wave election or something of that nature. In the very same year, you know, 65 members of the Tea Party were elected in this right. country. And, and something about that certainly was related to the economic crash that had occurred in 2008 and, um, and liberal solutions being threatening to Tea Partiers. Is there any relationship between that 2010 and our 2010? Uh, well, I, 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 at a literal level, I don't know. I mean, I do know that the, you know, Western uh, political consultants are very active in Hungary. Uh, so, so I knew, no, at that level, there's a, uh, there's absolutely a connection. Of course, the crisis hit Hungary too, and you know, liberal, so, you know, and uh, you know, this was seen to be caused by excessive liberalism, and so this helped discredit liberal, uh, you know, li liberal recipes. So, so in that sense, they absolutely are related. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture, and uh, you uh, quoted as a right wing party. And I think I am from Hungary. I think I, I couldn't agree not with the uh, economic poli economic policy, yeah. the economic policy. And I think in Hungary, unfortunately, everything is confused ideologically. What is left is right. What is right is left. Let me tell you the um, uh, healthcare system. The Fidesz, which is a right wing party, wanted a state uh, run uh, healthcare system. The left, the communist or the socialist, which is a leftist party, uh, denied the classical leftist ideology and wanted to privatize the uh, healthcare yeah. system. So it, it's a very, I think it's much more complicated. I, I don't know why, but it's not like here in the left and right. Yes. Yeah, so, so you're. By the way, you're quite right on this. Uh, uh, you know, the right wing in some way. So, so you know, maybe they should be labeled populist. Uh, they're definitely a populist party. So there's a, uh, uh, on econ so, so just to expand on one thing that, uh, that she said, which, which is that the left-right things are in some sense reversed. Uh, what we're used to thinking of as right-wing in economic terms is usually held by the left in Eastern Europe and vice versa. So free mar the, the socialist successor parties tend to be free market, par you know, free market parties. And it's the right, uh, you know, it's the right wing parties that want to reassert state control. So, so it's reversed to what we have, uh, as you, as you correctly point out, uh, the reverse of what we're used to thinking. So it's a good point. I, I find that terribly important because had you started that this conversation today out with that statement, we all would have had a much easier time understanding as we try to compare democracy in Hungary and democracy in the United States because the right-wing party here represents totally different things than the right-wing party there. And I think it's very confusing that you didn't, didn't start with that because the, the, the Fidesz party has, as I understand it, in Hungary, continues to support universal ac access to education, universal social security for everyone. There's been, uh, it's, it's been it, it's as much as they possibly can try to perpetuate state support for pensions. Uh, it, it all the things that we as Democrats, as liberals in this country, are trying to get in the United States, they're there and Fidesz is defending them. So it, it's not a, 
Well, so, 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 yeah. hey, Pop, just what's with that? After, the, after 20 years of borrowing money from the, yeah. from the International Monetary Fund, so that today, Hungary carries a massive debt, debt payment, and this government has no actual, very few resources with which to try to maintain or boost the, the economy. So yes, well, this is their, this well, is what they say. But that, yeah, isn't that yeah. true? I that mean, is as true. A, as an yeah. economist, as a political scientist, isn't that fact-based? So, so first of all, first of all, in, in, within Hungary, you know, people that self-identify as right-wing, you know, or as conservative, when they tick off that part, those are the fetus. So, so it's confusing for us because we have, you know, we have a different way, but but it's not confusing for Hungarian voters. Uh, uh, it's just not. Uh, Fidesz filled the space by former conservative Christian parties. It's allied with the Christian Democratic Party. Uh, these were all just, uh, you know, they, the concepts may be fuzzy, but, but they're very clear uh, in terms of labels, uh, first of all, within the country. So we're confused, but they're not confused. Um, we have a right to be confused because it is different for us. I get that. But the Fidesz voters are not confused about this. Uh, secondly, uh, it is true that, uh, you know, so they're, po- so I, you know, maybe I should have labeled them populist. So they're a very populist uh, party. They want control of these uh, resources in order to achieve their, uh, you know, their ends, which are to make the Hungarian nation, I mean, these are Orban's words, more uh, paraphrase of Orban, Orban's words, more competitive, uh, you know, with other countries. So, so on the one hand, they want universal, you know, health care. But on the other hand, uh, you know, they can be very discriminatory. The government can be very discriminatory when it comes to minorities uh, and other people that it thinks doesn't deserve, uh, you know, doesn't deserve the welfare. So, for example, very strong workfare. Uh, you know, this this notion of uh, you know you have a responsibility. You 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 get things, but you also have a responsibility to do things in exchange for those. That's what Bill Clinton is. <laughs> that is Bill Clinton, yeah. If I could just intervene on that for a second. Um, there is a fundamental difference between the conservative tradition in Europe and the American conservative tradition. And one of them, for example, that's obvious is the American tradition is so closely tied to religiosity. But another one is that the European tradition, unlike the American tradition, has never and is still not married to free uh, market economics. You know, for us, the right is, you know, free market economics above everything, which, and that's simply not true. You, you know, Otto, Otto Bismarck invents the, the, the welfare state. So, so being on the right is not the same as being a free market here. Yeah. Oh, what's the relationship of corporate power to the state? Uh, well, you know, Fidesz has it. You know, it's, Fidesz has its oligarchs too. I mean, you know, very rich people that support, uh, you know, the government. And so, so I don't uh, know a lot at the granular level on that, but that's definitely there. And uh, and this is very similar to Putin. And so, so if you're if you're in the circle and then you and then you you try to rebel, I mean, uh, you know, it's not good. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know the party is very vituperative, uh, but but you know it does have very wealthy backers. Uh, there's no question about it. And so corporate power, whatever the rhetoric, uh, you know whatever the rhetoric uh, that's going on about populism, uh, Fidesz members themselves uh, are being enriched by this, and they also have powerful corporate backers. But by the way, this is not exclusive to Fidesz. Whoever controlled the state after 1989 in Hungary, left or right, enriched themselves at the people's expense. So this is not a partisan statement. This is this this applies to both sides. Yes. Uh, what is the? Oh. Go ahead, lady. What is the Fidesz's narrative on the interwar period and the communist period in broad strokes? The the the, the broader strokes is that they want to merge them together. Uh, 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 so, so, well, actually, uh, take that back. They want to merge together the fascist period, so, so the, the uh, Arrow Cross period. Uh, so, so, the, so the Constitution condemns crimes from 1944. So the fascist period and the communist period, those crimes, uh, you know, they condemn. But they don't include the interwar period. So the interwar period, uh, 
uh, I, I think, uh, you know, bears some parallels with the present period. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some parallels. They, they have a sympathy for Horthy. They don't, b because it's sort of uh, uh, not the appropriate thing to do, Fides doesn't uh, come out and wave this flag. But they're not, uh, as I said in the talk, there's a sort of a silent uh, 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 or weak condemnation or a silent support when Jobbik Push, what Jobbik, which does, and Jobbik's not in the government, so it's freer to do other things. Uh, when Jobbik does, you know, want to erect statues uh, to Horthy, for example, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting to watch the Fides reaction. And so, so Fides people will go, but in an unofficial capacity. It's this kind of thing. So, so to distance them, so to to show support, but at the same time to distance themselves from what they know will provoke an international, uh, you know, international outcry. Okay. I just would like to bring this into a little broader picture. I just read that uh, uh, European uh, right wing, wing movements are kind of developing, and the France has 14 mayors that are right wing. And this doesn't seem to uh, decrease lately in the last few years. So. Being a right-wing government, if that's what you call it, is not at all unusual even in Western Europe. Well, so so that's absolutely true. So the, the, the sui generis situation is one party becoming so powerful that they're able to unilaterally change all the rules of the game. If, you know, getting into power, if Marine Le Pen and the Front National you know, gets into power, well, you know, there'll be a lot of hand wringing about it, but it, but as you say, it's not that unusual. Uh, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I left Hungary four years ago, and uh, I like to reflect on what you said about the policies. Um, I didn't experience uh, the policies or universal health care as something that serves people, as something that typically could be, uh, that could be labeled left-wing or socialist. Uh, um, Meaning it was, dis it was discriminatory? Is that what you're it saying? It is discriminatory yeah. and, and also it, uh, the working class is uh, very, has so many burdens more, and more, more than uh, it had years ago. So, and uh, uh, the poverty is, is and uh, the death rate poverty and, and uh, that, that's one thing and the, the other thing is, is the general fear in society which uh, I came late unfortunately I couldn't find a building I don't know if you mentioned uh, and also the emotional thing that people are very emotional about supporting or uh, not being against so that is Yeah, so, so let me just say a little more on this. So, so just to expand on that a little bit. So for example, if you're different mm -hmm. in Fidesz's version of difference, so if you're gay or, or you know, a, a, any number of things, you know, you just don't benefit from these. Uh, you know, it has a very specific conception of, of who benefits. And you just don't, you know, if you're not of the religion that they think is the proper religion or if you're not of the lifestyle that the government thinks is the proper lifestyle, you will not benefit from these uh, state, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're simply, you're, you're, in some sense, you're outside. Uh, you just are. Uh, it's not to say that millions of people don't benefit; they do. Uh, but the, but they have a very they have a very specific conception of it. I really would like to understand yeah. that. You're saying they don't get access to health care because they maybe no no. I'm saying that uh, so, so no. Uh, I'm saying that uh, you know in the Constitution, uh, uh, you know, life begins at conception. Which means if you want, you know, if if you want to have an abortion, you can get it. Uh, you can get it, of course, but it's no longer, uh, you know, it's now the state's business. Your abortion, because they, it's a criminal act. Life be, in the Constitution, life begins at conception. Therefore, if you get an abortion, you're, you know, it's like it's like in the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you're committing a criminal act. 
and it's, uh, you know, marriages between a man and a woman. I mean, you know, right or wrong, whether you agree or disagree, these things were sort of, uh, you know, the, the state, if you will, didn't have an opinion on that before. I would be shocked if, and, I, if, if, Hungary, yeah. if you can't have an abortion in Hungary. I, I you, can have an, you can have an abortion. The point <laughs> is, of course you can have one. But you can't march into a, you, you, you know, you can't go with your health insurance uh, and uh, have a medical procedure, you know, with your state health insurance and have a medical procedure. Yeah, you can go, you know, there are, I'm sure there are, pro I don't know this, I don't know this from personal research, but I, I'm sure you can walk into, there are clinics now where you can walk in and get an abortion in Hungary. Yeah. But it's a criminal act. It's paid for by the government. It's criminal act. Life begins at, life begins at, con life begins at conception in the new constitution. Uh, I, uh, I never heard it, 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 it uh, uh, I never heard it uh, as labeled as criminal acts. But and, and what I like to emphasize is uh, the, um, now you, you seem to talk about discrimination, which is very strong in Hungary, and it has I think in a sense it has always been strong. Uh, I feel that since Fidesz it became stronger, but also towards the poor. And and uh, so the oligarchy and and uh, and uh, the, 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 the elitism, in a sense. Mm -hmm. I'm just feeling that this is really crucial what you're uh -huh. saying. Now about the poor. I'm sorry. About the poor. Yes, yeah. because what I'm seeing developing, uh, I'm Hungarian too, and I was here four years ago. So, but I go back, and it's kind of really hard to understand that there's this real populist speech, and that has nothing to do with that, what is actually happening. And I think what's really happening, it's kind of an oligarchic and mafia state development. So there is the populist kind of, you know, what's good for the people, but what they are actually doing has nothing to do with what's good for the people. So it looks like that, you know, like, like everything is becoming like extremely centralized from like books uh, children are studying from to like all education, like really like all uh, things uh, of like public, I don't know, whatever, I'm sorry. And they are also develop or creating these parallel institutions. So like, for example, in art, like an art academy that's theirs, like their own Greek. So everything their own, and then they will withdraw money from everywhere else and put all money there, and the money will be distributed due to their... That's right, so, I mean... And that, but I think it's really important that there is like one, like the brainwash thing that's very important, and then kind of dependency. And I'm not exactly sure that it's true that they are trying to get rid of the ex-communists. I think like people who have different kind of paths whether that's a communist past or like a free for free past, they are really uh, good people to blackmail. So they kind of, they are built into the system and they are creating right. this whole chain of dependency. And people who are out will get prosecuted for anything and people so who are in will not. So what I meant by illustration was that, uh, you know, the withdrawal of state support. So actually, act like you say, you know, the artists are usually liberal or they're socialists, and so they don't get anything, and then, and then, and then there are, if you will, state sanctioned, you know, that would be too strong. They're not state sanctioned, but they're artist friendly to the regime, uh, and then th through control of the funding, those artists would get uh, money. So it's not, you know, getting rid of uh, the socialists, but they don't get any support from the state. You know, essentially, they're, they're, they're on their own. It's not people with communist past, it's something different, I think. And there are a lot of things they are doing that sound like are for the people like for example like uh, decreasing like the utility bills but actually these things advance the rich people not the poor people so like well this is a classic uh, you know the regi uh, you know before the election uh, you know this is classic populist ta tactic we're going to lower your bills right before the election this is like the hundred dollars I got back was it George W. Bush yeah. It's like the hundred dollar check I got back during the Bush administration. Uh, you know, it's a tried and true democratic, uh, you know, tactic. And just the amount of stealing is yeah. huge. Like, it's huge in the corruption. Uh, I'm, I'm still a little surprised. Uh, I want to circle back to the first point about Turkey. Um, yeah. That kind of comparison. Because, yeah. you know, in your talk, you really gave a lot of emphasis on this political dynamic. You called it a fluke because the other parties kind of fell out of favor at the right time. And so that's how you explain the electoral, uh, the major, the large electoral majority. But you know, for me, it's still I'm still a little uncomfortable with that because over four years, 
putting in all these radical changes and their majority nearly stays the same. Um, uh, if you know, uh, they, they there's no backlash when you know you make all all these different changes, um, which seem like you know when you're repressing the media, um, seem somewhat blatant, uh, probably to the public. And again, you know, if you control the media, maybe they can, uh, maybe there's a pu pu uh, an issue of information control. Uh, the, the people are not seeing what you're telling us. Um, but I, I'm surprised um, you're now telling us that it's, uh, you know, describing them as populist. And so I would be surprised if there isn't some kind of popular mo movement and momentum that happened in 2010. And I think that the conversation is kind of trying to figure this out a little bit about what happened for this political cataclysm among the people, whether it be emotional reaction mm -hmm. or a strategic political that allowed them to mm -hmm. all of a sudden capture mm -hmm. such a large following um, and, and sustain it despite all these, you know, what would seem like unpopular well, things that they did. I mean, I can tell you, so the Fidesz voters in 2010, some of them were not Fidesz voters before, but voted for Fidesz because the other parties collapsed. Secondly, Hungarian, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at public opinion polls, Hungarians are not liberal. So it's not like some of these policies aren't actually supported. So restriction on pornography or, you know, uh, or, you know, hate speech or whatever. I mean, these are, you know, I would say supported. Uh, you know, they're not supported by ideological liberals. So the liberal intelligentsia thinks this is just, you know, the end of the world. It's a, it's a restriction on peace. But the ordinary people, it's like, yeah, you know, uh, these are, you know, I, I will use the term a conservative uh, a population that you know doesn't think that anybody should just be free to you know parade anything on the you know public airwaves or you know whatever the particular issue is. And so I think you know the 2014 vote reflects the fact that you know some of these things are like okay. I mean people are resentful that the former communist uh, elite was able to enrich themselves uh, during the uh, early years. There's a lot of resentment about that. I mean the PM Ferenc Gyurcsány was a uh, I think he worked in the communist youth. Mm -hmm. uh, is that correct? Yes. He worked in peace, which is, you know, was not a, I mean, the, the smartest people didn't go into the, you know, the youth, uh, the socialist youth brigade, youth brigade. I mean, he was not, and now he's a, you know, multi-billionaire. Uh, and it's through sort of, quite frankly, shady dealings, which are known, uh, uh, you know, shady dealings that allowed him to then become a billionaire. And you could, you know, multiply that story many times. And people do resent this. I mean, Fidesz is tapping into something real uh, uh, that's well, going on in society. I just, I just yeah. would like to add something yeah. to this side. side. You did not include the number of wars, so percentages right. don't make sense. Because I know I was in Hungary when the voting was in this year, 1914. Yeah. And like, I don't know, 50% of the people didn't even go to vote. Yes, that's they right. So turn out, yeah. So, so these percentages don't make sense if you compare them to the 2010 numbers. But these, but these are the only ones that matter, though. <laughs> these are the only ones that matter. Yeah, I know, but, but, but your yeah, question was matter. about the ideology of the people and who, is, who are supporting who You know which party voted from a low turnout? Mm -hmm. Jovic. But this we know from analyses of the election. So in places where turnout was really low, Jovic tended to do the best. Because the Jovic, you know, these are highly mobilized, uh, uh, you know, people, uh, as these kinds of parties always have. And, you know, huge, you know, over 90% turnout among their hardcore. I mean, these are like, te you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make, I'm only going to make this comparison in a narrow way. It's like, you know, Tea Party voters, you know, highly motivated, you know, 100% turnout. Uh, because they really want to change things. Yeah, but in 2014, yeah. there wasn't 100 percent turnout for voting in the population. No, but Jobbik was the one, so they're not Jobbik voters. So, um, and then you would be able yeah. to see the change. What was the difference? Mm -hmm. I don't recall. I, I don't recall. So that could support your argument. Yeah. With yeah. that, with yeah. that, oh. Oh. I, 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 would, I would like to give Professor Wittenberg his name. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay.